Team science over the years, I don't think there's anyone in this room almost that he hasn't interacted with uh, in terms of research and project. He has uh, basically built programs of research with many other people outside of his division and even the department and nationally. He is currently the PI of our Nutrition and Obesity Research Centre from NIH. There are 16 of those in the country, and Paul's going to talk about that today. I just want to point out that on this campus, we have amazing resources for everyone in the department to make use of. The NORC is one of these. Things like the NORC, CORDS, CCTSI have a spectrum of services to offer, plus all of the cores that Peter Buttery has put together. So we're really grateful to Paul today for speaking about um, the NORC and what it has to offer. And I want to tell you that Paul and I shared an office the size of this space when Paul first arrived. Everyone said, you know, space is an issue. And this was on the old campus on 8th and Colorado. Where's Paul going to go when he comes? I'm going to go into my office. Well, and everyone's looking at him, what are you talking about? Family fits a desk. I'm like, well, I'll get a smaller desk and we'll get a second smaller desk and we'll put the, another filing cabinet over here. So if we ever wanted to, and this is when you actually had papers on paper, by the way. So this is how old we are. But if we wanted to get to the filing cabinet, the other person had to leave the office, move their chair to let the other person get the filing cabinet. Mm -hmm. We both still are alive <laughs> and we both still collaborate to this day. So with that, I'll let Paul take it away. The, remembering those early days where we were crammed into a closet, uh, I had nothing but fond memories. She's about to leave the room, so then I'll leave. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just getting on. Um, yeah, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. I'm, today I'm going to tell you about the Colorado Nutrition Obesity Research Center. And this is a, uh, a center grant that uh, I have been involved with pretty much my entire time here at the University of Colorado. I'm the director, and uh, the associate director is Dan Bessison. And uh, I just want to highlight uh, Carol Henna, who is a critical grant special, uh, grants uh, and contract specialist, who keeps this grant uh, functioning and in compliance. We could go off the rails quite a bit if we didn't have good administrators to help us along. It's just so critical. So why should you care about this center? Well, you should care because nutrition affects almost everything. It affects every tissue and organ in the body and, and has some sort of relationship with uh, all disease pathologies. And overnutrition in particular, uh, obesity um, is tied to a lot of these uh, disease pathologies. It affects every tissue and organ in the body as well. And it's so prevalent, over two thirds of uh, people in the United States have overweight or obesity. And this is approaching 20% of my kids. So it's very prevalent and both overnutrition and nutrition themselves affect the body. And so um, as we have approached it over the past 20 or 30 years, it, we have really positioned nutrition and obesity as a hub for interdisciplinary translational team science. We can collaborate with a lot of different people in a lot of different disciplines. And I think that that's really where this center grant comes from. 
So just about uh, the center grant, it's an NIBDK sponsored grant, P30 mechanism, it brings in about $4 million in direct costs, about 6 million over five years. And it's been funded since 1995 in various forms. They used to call it a clinical nutrition research unit. Uh, and we've transitioned to NORCS uh, about 10 or 15 years ago. The mission of our center is to advance the science of nutrition obesity by facilitating interdisciplinary collaborative and translational research by fostering the development of early career scientists in, in this uh, field. We have a theme that goes along with our center and that is the prevention and treatment of obesity and its metabolic complications across the lifespan um, from cradle to grave. We are one of, not 16, we are only one of 11 centers um, across the, that are funded across the country. And you can see that in Colorado, we are well positioned in the Rocky Mountain region, uh, that we're pretty much the only, uh, the only center for a lot, uh, you know, for, for flyover country. Um, and uh, the National North Program uh, has, has a number of collaborative efforts that are ongoing uh, between centers. They fund diversity and inclusion, targeted pilot programs. There's a lot of committees and things at the national program that, that folks um, on a national level try to uh, create uh, networking and collaborative science at, at the national program. You know. Uh, on a national level. At this local level, uh, our center has members in five different institutions. We have people at the University of Utah, Colorado State, CU Boulder, CU Denver, and the vast majority of our researchers are here on Anschutz, uh, on Anschutz campus. So this is a uh, some characteristics of our research base and how it's grown over the years. Um, starting way back in 1994, we are now up to about 120 funded faculty um, uh, who are performing research in the areas of nutrition and obesity. Um, this, this group of funded faculty we call our regular research base. Uh, there's, uh, they're spread across the, the career stage with full associate and assistant professors. 86% of them are located on Anschutz Medical Campus, but they come from four different colleges and schools. And it's a pretty diverse group scientifically because they come from about 30 different organizational units on campus. We also have this group of people um, who we call affiliate members or associate members. These are people who are not necessarily funded, but um, engage in our research uh, with our research cores. They engage with our enrichment programs uh, and some of the activities that we uh, support. These include uh, fac um, um, trainees, uh, faculty scientists who, who don't necessarily use our course, and of course, educators who are interested in nutrition obesity. This is the funding portfolio um, of that 120 faculty. We, you can see that we have a diverse research portfolio with regards <clears throat> to what institute the money is coming from. Because obesity and nutrition are so, you know, they affect so many disease states, NIDDK, even though this is funded by NIDDK, they are okay um, and they find value in uh, supporting nutrition obesity research um, at other institutes. And so only about half of our funding comes from DDK. You can see how the rest of it spreads out um, because of the diseases that are affected by obesity. But our total research portfolio as of the last funding cycle is a little bit over $50 million. And so this isn't what I have gathered. This is what the research uh, base has, has garnered. And it's a snapshot um, uh, in, in 2019 when we went in for our renewal. 
you can see the types of grants and, and the number of grants that this, this center supports, 120 R-level grants, 17 science projects, a number of VA merits, a number of foundation awards. And, and what's really important is the number of career development awards that are the K-level or CDA level um, uh, grants. And of course, we, so we have a strong interest in supporting early career scientists through pilot and feasibility program, programs that are not only with the North, but on campus. So this is the structure of the center. This is kind of how we operate. Uh, we have a pilot and feasibility program. Um, we have three biomedical research cores and we have an enrichment program. And all of these serve to support uh, our research base, that, which is uh, um, really, um, uh, we have categorized them in five separate things. These are not things that we have assigned people to. Um, these are things within our research base where people have coalesced and um, begin uh, studying with collaborations and, and building team science uh, on their own. And so this doesn't add up to 100% because a lot of this research, um, it, a lot of researchers are involved in more than one of these themes. So about 30% um, of our research is, is our, of our scientists are involved in early life influences. This is our metabolic programming in utero, um, postnatally, and the development of childhood <laughs> uh, and adolescent obesity. We have 43% of our research base that has research in the area of women's health and sex differences. We have 32% who are specifically studying um, energy expenditure, uh, exercise, and physical activity. About half of our uh, researchers uh, are focused on metabolic complications uh, of obesity, and this includes cancer, uh, cardiovascular disease, diabetes, um, so a, a number of metabolic diseases that are associated with overnutrition. And then about 40% of our research base is specifically developing interventions that, that can improve uh, health, so to advance and bring, bring about better strategies for weight loss or weight loss maintenance. So like I said, we're su supported by an enrichment program, a pilot and feasibility program, and three biomedical research cores. And I'll just tell you a little bit about those now. Dr. Ed Melanson runs our enrichment program. And our, our enrichment program is a little bit different than most centers and departments on campus. About 10 or 15 years ago, we polled our, our research base and said, what do you want from an enrichment program? How do we, you know, do you want a seminar and, and whatnot? The vast majority of the comments that came back we said, we have too many seminars. We don't need another seminar program. And so we have taken a different strategy in leveraging existing seminar programs on campus and injecting money for uh, visiting faculty to support refreshments. Um, and so we partner with a broad range of seminar uh, programs and conferences on campus uh, to insert nutrition and obesity related content. We also sponsor a number of working groups on campus. Four listed here, Fat Chat was focused on the adipocyte biology. Bat Chat was brown adipocyte biology. <laughs> Uh, molecular metabolism and uh, one on exercise. I have to say, this is really the component of our enrichment program that has been affected by, um, by COVID and by the pandemic the most. We used to have about eight to 10 of these working groups that emerged naturally within our research base and they came to us and we were supporting them. And that's down to about four or five, well, four that you see here. Uh, and we're just now turning the corner to get to see some momentum in these interest groups. They all operate differently. Some of them operate only at the pub. Uh, some of them uh, have a little bit more formal of a, a, an environment, but they're all uh, run by members of our, uh, of our research base. We have an ANORC awards program. This is a grass pro grassroots program where anybody, a technician, uh, a 
um, a graduate student all the way up to faculty, anybody can nominate anyone for a number of categories that we have. And it's just really simple. It's done on a survey monkey um, uh, where people can go in and recognize uh, the talent and, and the special work that's being done by members of our research community. So we highlight the outstanding graduate student, the outstanding PhD instructor fellow, the outstanding MD instructor fellow, uh, the outstanding faculty member, and the outstanding uh, mentor of the year. And we do this on an annual basis. And it's really been a, a good community building approach that, that's helped uh, the NORC stay um, connected um, despite what's going on with the pandemic. Then we have thematic conferences, retreats, and social events. And, and you can see here, um, um, because we don't have a lot of things that are specific to the North, this, this enrichment program is inherently tied to the partnerships that we have on campus with other programs and centers. The pilot and feasibility program for the NORC has been one of our most successful um, components over the past 20 years. This targets early career investigators from the postdoctoral fellow up through the early career uh, or early fa junior faculty member who has not yet acquired an R01. And so this is a range of early career investigators that we're tar targeting this we give three or four <coughs> pilots out a year in the range of $40,000 over two years. Um, and so if you're interested, the, the announcement usually comes out in March and April, and then uh, the deadline is in May. This is some of the outcomes from our pilot and feasibility program. And this is just over the last 10 years um, of our report. We funded 40 investigators, 72% were women, 13% from underrepresented groups in academia. We really spread the money around for, to a number of different academic units. Uh, and we fund basic preclinical and clinical projects uh, in this program. The outcomes, 93% uh, of these individuals are still in academic research. Close to 60% got a K award, 35% are a PI on an R level award, 85% have attained additional funding beyond the pilot award, uh, and uh, about a quarter of them have gotten faculty positions and moved on to independent research programs at other institutions. So uh, this past cycle, over the last three years, we have gotten additional funding uh, to support um, underrepresented groups in academia. And so we've been able to support five additional awards. Our biomedical research cores span the translational ladder. Uh, they, they're designed to, to, to support nutrition obesity research at each um, step. And so we have uh, basic science, we have preclinical and clinical support, and then translational uh, and intervention type of support. Um, for those two things. So the three that we have, the molecular and cellular analytical core, the energy balance assessment core, and the clinical intervention and translation core. The, the molecular and cellular analytical core is led by Brian Bergman. He's the director and Karti Chunkar is the associate director. Brian oversees a mass spec lab uh, where they see uh, they have a lot of different assays for isotopic uh, isotope enrichment and quantitative lipidomics. Kartik uh, runs an RNA-seq pipeline and an informatics support. So for a lot of uh, our researchers, particularly clinical researchers that don't have, you know, this expertise uh, in their lab, they can go to Kartik and he can help um, guide them through the process of doing uh, RNA sequencing from cradle to grave. And he has a really nice partnership with the CU Cancer Center Genomics Core in providing that sequencing. So he provides the front and back end um, of that process. And then we have, uh, uh, and, and I should say that, that uh, uh, Karen zemsky Berry is the director of the lipidomics component of, uh, of the mass spec uh, laboratory. 
Um, and then Matt Jackman oversees the mitochondrial uh, function component where they have seahorse, Ouroboros, and some live cell imaging uh, capabilities in that lab. So here's the productivity over a five year period. I do this because I want to highlight the work and the volume that these people do and how important they are to the research infrastructure on campus. Um, over the prior five year uh, award cycle, they supported 77 different NORC members from 23 different organizational units on campus, 45 R01s, a number of different R level awards, 26 career development awards, pilot projects, uh, even folks at the end uh, with F and T fellowships um, and team science awards. And so they actually supported over that five year period the uh, publication of over 100, 450 publications. And you can see over the table of the right all the assays they do that we report. And it's the, just the volume of work that they do for individuals on campus is, is very um, impressive. Our energy balance assessment board is led by Dr. Wendy Court. Um, I'm the associate director overseeing small animal phenotyping, and Ed is the uh, Ed Melanson is an associate director. He oversees um, indirect calorimetry uh, and the whole room calor uh, the whole room calorimeter uh, up in the hospital. Um, but this core essentially does for both humans and animals essentially metabolic phenotyping. So body composition, measures of energy expenditure, uh, they use doubly labeled water, physical activity um, and physical fitness, exercise, pretty much most of what we can do in humans, we can do in animals with metabolic phenotyping as well. And uh, of course, um, as with the previous one, our partnerships here with the Colorado CTSI are critical uh, for this core to operate. Um, but we also have support from the Department of Medicine and Pediatrics here. And of course, uh, the Com Center for Comparative <coughs> Medicine, we all partner with um, uh, these organizations on campus to make um, this, this core operate. Um, this is the productivity for both the clinical and animal components of this core. The clinical side, they supported 91 clinical protocols for 55 unique PIs, 52 NIH supported. Uh, grants 22 uh, from, D, from DDK, and at the time that our renewal went in, they were actively supporting 35 protocols. On the animal side, 77 protocols for 44 DDPIs, uh, close to 50 uh, federally funded projects, and you can see all the different assays that they've done that. that um, so impressive metrics for what they do for a wide range of people on campus. And then finally, the clinical intervention and translational core. Again, we have partnerships here with the Anschutz Health and Wellness Center as well as the CTSI. Um, this is directed by Janine Higgins, um, and the associate director of this core is Vicki Catanacci. This core provides services in the relation in, in, in the areas of clinical translational design, where they have weight management, where they have helped people. Um, come in and implement the weight loss program. Um, Janine oversees a metabolic kitchen that provides diets and assessments of uh, food intake. Um, and they are involved with physical activity interventions and just general clinical research support. Um, but most of what is here is operating out of the health and wellness center. This is the productivity of this core, which is really impressive. 64 clinical pr protocols were supported 40, for 45 different PIs. Um, um, both junior and mid and senior level faculty were supported. 11 career development awards, um, and they supported 378 publications over that period of time. So a huge amount of work um, with, with a, a huge payoff. So I have uh, skimmed the surface uh, for those cores. If you want to hear from the core directors themselves, you can join us at the Colorado North Retreat on October 24th. Um, for those who are interested, you can contact Edna Lanson or you can register at the, the website that you see here. But at, at, that, at that retreat, 
Um, each one of the core directors and managers that I've shown you or talked to you about will be going into detail about what their cores do. I just want to end on uh, reiterating that the success of this research uh, uh, center uh, is due to its people and its collaborations with other departments and centers on campus. We would not be anywhere um, close to being uh, as successful as we are if we did not have those partnerships. And so I list those partnerships here because they're so critical. Um, the, the dean, two primary departments, medicine and pediatrics that are so critical to our operations. And then the number of centers that we have collaborative pilot programs, we have collaborative enrichment programs, um, and we just have a number of activities where we, um, and even with our cores, particularly the CCTSI, we have collaborations with. So I will leave it there. Hopefully that gives you a broad overview. If you want to know more, a couple of weeks we have a research retreat. I'll stop there and take questions. Well, can you elaborate on what else will be covered at the retreat? Who's the keynote and what's the topic? So we have a so we have a keynote speaker, John uh, John Tifo from uh, Kansas University Medical School. Uh, he's going to be speaking in the area of probably exercise and paddock and capitalism. But, uh, yeah. I don't think that I've seen the final slide, but that that's kind of where he comes from. Um, Kim Bruce is one of our rising stars within our research base, and she's going to be, uh, be giving a, a highlight feature presentation from our faculty. But then we have this uh, component, uh, you know, this, this portion where all of our pilot awardees are going to come in and give like, a five to ten minute spiel about what their pilot project's about, what they're doing, how, you know, what kind of progress that they have had. Um, so all, all of that, there's going to be a poster session, we'll have a, a reception. So nice that now that we can get together, um, we'll, we'll have uh, somewhat of a happy hour and, uh, and there'll be food and, and drink and things like that for, for people to network. And then there'll only be half a day. So we're going to fit all that in, in a half a day. Maybe, That's very efficient. Maybe, maybe. <laughs> When is your reapplication cycle? Or, or? So we're in our we are in our third year. Um, so we're now doing an evaluation of all of our cores and programs, uh, seeing what needs to be cut, what needs what we need to get rid of, what, uh, and we're going to um, do a survey of our research base and say what do you want that we don't have. Um, we are in that process right now because we're probably going to have to go in. In about a year, year and a half. Is so that, we're about halfway through our five year. Is that a competitive process every time? Oh yeah, yeah, it's very competitive. So people uh, trying to knock you off that list. That, yeah, they yeah, and, and they have plenty of time to to <coughs> get their center together for a new application. For us going in, we are judged upon the metrics that our cores are producing, and they're just fantastic, um, right? For new applications, they only have to show a promise of what they're going to do. <laughs> and so we're competing with that. And so our metrics actually have to be really top notch and say, we are a train going down the track. Do you want some of this success? That is essentially what we have to, to put out there. And I would, I would imagine every, Every cycle, somebody gets knocked off out of those 11. The last time, uh, Boston University got knocked out, um, and a new one popped up in UT Southwestern. Are you all in the same cycle, all 11 centers? Or? There's three different cycles that, that the centers can go in. So you usually know the four that you're competing <laughs> against, or the three or four that you're competing against, but you just don't know who's going to do. Um, and it's usually... If I remember correctly, it's about a three to four to one ratio of, of them funding. So it's just th these are huge grant applications with a lot of paperwork. They're not increasing the number of sites. Uh, no, no. In fact, we have asked not only that, but our budget has stayed the same for 20, 
eight years. <laughs> so they keep asking us to do more and, and we're competing to do more with the same budget that we've had way back then. When, and it, it seems like everybody is bringing to the table more institutional support, you know, uh, more this, that, and the other. They're, they're doing, uh, going the extra mile and institutions are, are going the extra mile coming together uh, to compete because they, they know that that's what it takes to actually um, look good next to the top, top notch uh, universities that are going in. Well, good luck. Can I ask a follow-up question about the pilots? The, the success is fantastic. And I didn't say when I introduced Paul, he is an in, incredibly, um, he's an excellent mentor. He's very kind. He really thinks about people's career trajectories. And he certainly helped me with my career as a colleague. But that's a really amazing success rate for a program that doesn't really have a formalised program for mentorship or so on. Can you comment on how you get people through and, and get them to that next level and that award through the pilot cycle? Yeah, so uh, as part of the mechanism, they actually tell us to stay away from uh, a lot of the things that help people get to the next stage of their career. So what looks good in our grant is we partner with the institutional training programs on campus. <laughs> they provide the fellowship. They provide a lot of the educational and training. Um, and what we do is we meet with them regularly uh, um, every every six months or so with the pilot awardees, making sure that, hey, is your mentor doing their job? Uh, you know, are you receiving institutional support from your department or division? Um, and are you taking advantages, uh, advantage of the educational programs that the CTSI offers or that other uh, programs like the Center for Women's Health, they have a lot of educational and training programs for early career development, uh, early career investigators. And we just make sure that they are taking advantage of uh, a lot of those things on campus. Um, and I think, I think they are so successful because the institutional training programs that we have on this campus are really good. Um, and really dedicated to, to helping early career investigators uh, establish their independence. Did, did you guys have your own space or is it all departmental? It's, I, we have a little bit of NORC designated laboratory space, but essentially uh, a lot of the clinical operations operate in the health and wellness center. Um, uh, our, our teams like Brian, they operate in endocrinology. Kartik operates in peds, you know, nutrition. So, you know, they're, they're departmentally uh, given space for the most part. I think my wet lab is probably the only one that has somewhat of a designation. Uh, but, oh, that's North. But I'm still endocrinology, right? Yeah. No, I pretty and, and, we, and we very much appreciate this space. So. Can I ask one last question? The, the metrics are so important. As you say, that's how, how you keep getting funded. How do you develop metrics? And I think a lot of us struggle with this. For the more esoteric parts of the program, you know, I, I know for CIT, I brought metrics in like crazy town. But for the more esoteric things like fat chat, back chat, chow chat, um, these connectors, how do you think about metrics for those? You just count attendees or? We do keep track of who, of general volumes there um, and whether or not they're meeting. Uh, it, it's, it's tough to say what a review, what kind of reviewer metric would want in an enrichment program. Um, and so the, the only thing that we usually have is attendance and participation and, and things like that. You know, if my ideal to go back into the grant was like, oh, fat chat. Oh, they talked about some sort of team science project. And oh, what, what came out of it? They wrote this big PO1 project. And that would be my ideal. And I would take that and throw that in the grant and say, look how good they're, you know, look how well they're doing. Um, but those are anecdotal or, or isolated incidents that you can talk about in the grant, but 
It's not like a number. We had 10 of those that happened. Have you ever kept track of the number of papers published from those? Because we often talk about data that ends up going in a paper and people contribute a lot of ideas to how to look at the data, interpret the data, analyze the data. Not at that level of granularity. No, I mean, we, we, we essentially connect papers to, to cores in general, and that's about as far as our brain cells can get before going crazy. I mean, it, it's, there's a lot of minutia in these grants, and we, we just don't have that level of brain here. Have photographs of your social events. It's not a bad idea. I like that idea. You know, pictures are going in in grants now uh, a lot. There, it's a lot more common now to actually. And you know what? On my last summary statement, the one I mean, we did really well um, in our last renewal. But one thing that they said, "Give me more pictures. I want more figures and pictures." And a picture speaks a thousand words. Uh, so. It's not a bad idea. Certainly gonna do that. Well, thank you all for coming. Thank you for all. Appreciate it.